key ingredients to an OCP being relevant. In other words, it's not just a you know a bit of paper that gets put away on a shelf. Uh, most likely, a, a body of elected representatives, a council in this case, who stand by that OCP, and a community that really cares about what the community looks like and what the vision is. And I came in at the the tail end of um, the OCP planning process, and it it seemed to me to be very promising as far as community involvement and people getting very impassioned about what they cared about in Cumberland. And I remember the two consultants who were hired by the village at the time, Dale Bishop and Will Marsh, and they did a summary. And the thing that I remembered, they said, even though Cumberland's you know, a, a quite a disparate community as far as the makeup. They hadn't seen such a a cohesive OCP as Cumberland's in the 30 years they've been doing planning. And I thought that was really remarkable. Because, you know, there's, there's tree planters and there's, there's the old coal miners and, you know, everything else in between. So it was interesting to know that our OCP really pulled all those those factors together. And so here we are, some four years later, and where's the OCP? Um, you know, it's quoted. There's various visions of what it might be, but it seems to me that there's still a lot of people who are passionate about what went into that document. Um, certainly if you look at initially when Trilogy put their proposal to change the OCP, how many people came out and said, we love our OCP, it's great. We want it to be as it is because we put all this energy into it. So my sense is that the, the second part of, of the formula, if you will, is still there, people care. But we don't have the first part, which is the political will that took and put together the OCP and gave it a life and could potentially continue it. It's, it's essentially, it, to me, it's, it's a document that, from a political point of view, it's not relevant anymore as far as our, our council is concerned. And um, why is that? I mean, I guess that's the question for this documentary. Um, why have, or why has all the energy that's gone into that, that creation, essentially been abandoned. And I think you can look at a, a number of different potential reasons for it. I think in Cumberland's case it's probably fairly simple. Um, there's a sense here that we need development because our infrastructure is crumbling. And if we have development, we'll get the money to repair it. And it doesn't matter how that development comes, it'll give us dollars to do what we need. So that to me is a very poor reason to abandon an OCP. I think if we were like other communities that have stood by their OCP, and there's a number of them around North America, where they have a very strong vision, not only do the people care about it, but their elected representatives do too. And they've said no to fast food outlets, to big box stores, to sprawl, uh, to any number of things that are very tempting uh, to any small community to, to look at those kinds of things and say, wow, you know, we're going to get rich. But they've stood by it and consequently, in some communities, McDonald's doesn't even have the golden arches. They've been told they have to stick within the vision. They can come, but it has to look this way or in some communities where there aren't even any McDonald's. So, what do we want to look like? Do we want to look like everywhere else? I mean, if the runaway sprawl the Trilogy and Coal Valley and any number of other developers uh, seem to want to promote, then what's the point of being different. We'll be like Surrey, we'll be like Nanaimo, we'll be like Kelowna, we'll be anywheresville. And I certainly come to Cumberland for that reason. So what we might end up being is this kind of cute little 
um, old folksy village surrounded by suburbia. And that ain't my vision of Cumberland. And I, I think if you ask a lot of people, those who have come here recently, they would agree. That's not what they want. So, um, what do you do about it? And I think one of the things that it's really useful to do is to look at those communities that have that vision and they stuck by it and look at what they've got. And I think we'll see that there's all sorts of people queuing up to do great development in those those communities. But it's in the within the guidelines of what that community wants. So if we had to examine those other communities and take out those components of what worked, then maybe we can do that here. Uh, I, I believe that we could, and I think we should, because it's still a great place to live. And um, if you ask any number of people, I think they would agree. You know, um, look at all those folks that came out to the OCP, they haven't all moved away. They had a vision. <laughs> They're still here. You know, maybe several hundred people. So. That's my take on it today. Hello, I'm Grace Doherty. I live on Derwent and Third in Cumberland, and I've lived here about three years. I was familiar with the OCP uh, official community plan being developed in Cumberland, as I was living in the valley, but really didn't become knowledgeable of its contents until I attended one of the presentations at the very end of the exercise. I have since moved to Cumberland uh, and I was partly attracted by the official community plan which seemed very innovative, um, extremely inclusive of all factions of the community and showed an amazing degree of consensus between people as to the vision they had for Cumberland as a community. And I felt after reading that and attending the presentation that I shared that vision and wanted to become a part of that. Um, Initially, I'd been involved more with the Cumberland Community Forest Society and the Stream Keepers, so I was more aware of the viewscape, the forests and wetlands around Cumberland, but have since become um, very much impassioned with the community itself, the people, the, the structures around, the history that's beneath our feet, and feel this is something that we want to preserve, not to the um, impediment of more people coming here or businesses moving here, but not to lose that character as we do develop and as inevitable as development is, I felt that one part of the official community plan that really spoke to orderly development was the residential containment boundary. And that um, was designed to assure that there would be slow orderly growth so that, that feeling of community, the walkability, the, the friendliness of it would not be lost. And that development as it happened, starting with the existing uh, residential containment boundary, moving into the residential reserve, and then beyond that would uh, conform with the character of Cumberland and would reflect the things that are unique about Cumberland. It's been quite concerning to me that um, as time goes on we're seeing more and more challenges to that official community plan. The first one being uh, shortly after it was completed by Trilogy Properties Vancouver Island who wanted to develop a very large tract of land Initially they seemed to be very much in tune with the OCP. I believe that their CEO had actually attended some of the meetings and their initial meetings with the community where we did a visioning exercise reflected their willingness to conform to the OCP and maybe bring some new innovative ideas uh, into the mix. Uh, more variety in housing, maybe a, a lifestyle centre, a different approach to commercial at the highway. Um, but about a year into the process, it seemed that that vision had changed a great deal, uh, possibly driven by the market, but certainly moving much towards a residential base and commercial base. And one of the strengths of the official community plan was that when the map was set up of how the area would be developed, there was the residential containment boundary which contained the historical downtown core and the yellow area showing the residential around that, the black dotted line showing the boundary of that residential development, and the reserve areas on the northern side of that historic core. 
The trilogy properties are the properties outlined in red along the highway, in addition to the one in the blues at the bottom, which is currently working forest and wetlands greenway. The vision for that initially seemed to conform with the commercial intent for that property, but as time went on, it moved into more and more residential, including at this point, mixed residential and commercial in virtually all of the lands on the far side of the highway, some of that freestanding multifamily, and residential even on the western side, including the land near Maple Lake, which was intended for possibly some sort of resort area which would have ongoing revenue for the community and would allow the greatest number of people to enjoy that park-like setting. The area at the bottom, as I mentioned, was working forest and that is to be um, fairly high density residential and that's of great concern to many people not only because of the loss of the working forest but because it is within the viewscape of Cumberland and whereas the clear cut is not particularly attractive the trees would grow back once it's developed that process is irreversible so my concern I, I guess for the the different uh, official community plan amendments that have been sought through the various bylaws is the residential containment boundary I think that was the, the one assurance that Cumberland residents felt they had that we would have orderly development, that it would progress slowly and would have a pattern to it which would assure that the character of Cumberland wasn't lost in the process. And this is something I feel has really been lost. The one section of the Fish Affinity Plan for those properties east of the highway has already gone to fourth reading and adoption. So those properties has, have been changed. Um, a few of the remaining properties on that side, as well as the properties on the western side of the highway, are in the process of having official community plan amendments. And those two on the western side of the highway will increase the residential component. So we've lost commercial with the potential for uh, revenue. We've lost working forest with the potential for revenue. And we've gained a lot of residential, uh, quite a distance from the downtown core of the uh, large lot where the working forest was, only about 25% of that is within 10 minutes of the downtown core. Much of the property on the western side of the highway likewise is more than a, a usual walk for the average individual. And certainly those properties on the far side of the highway are, are car dependent, something which we'd hope to avoid. I think this whole process has um, also raised a lot of concerns about community participation. While there have been a lot of meetings, initially these meetings were very controlled and public input was limited. When a petition was presented to our council, when the first um, the public hearing was held for the official community plan amendments, there were 781 signatures, there were 195 letters, uh, all opposing the official community plan. Not development, not this particular developer, but just the amendments to the official community plan, which they felt just uh, devastated it. And uh, I think that it made people feel that their input was not valued. 781 people with the voters list of a few or 1,500 was about 50%, 52% of the eligible voters. And it would appear from council's response to that at public meetings that that input was not considered. If anything, it was um, put down as being uh, obtrusive. It got in the way, it was obstructive. There was a feeling amongst many people in the community that their input um, was not valued and was not followed. But process aside, to me the biggest concern is the residential containment boundary. And I think this is, from this flows all of the concerns. The freestanding residential uh, can not only lead to sort of ghettoizing of uh, residential areas by putting it right alongside a highway, but it also creates a much greater demand on water and sewer uh, systems. Right now we're in stage three water restrictions, which we do go through on occasion, but I think it underlines the fact that we're just on the edge of what our water system can cope with right now, with no guarantee. And that's another thing that was in the official community plan, was that there should be a guarantee of services to any areas that we're going to develop, whether it's for commercial, industrial, or residential. But residential, because of the nature of residential, certainly is going to draw more of water uh, smart growth might uh, refer to densification, but that on the edge of an existing community becomes sprawl and becomes a greater burden on the water system to be able to get uh, potable water out to that area and sewage away from it. 
There's also concern on some of those lots in the, the headwaters to three large fish bearing creek systems, Roy Creek, Mullard Creek and Piercy Creek. The air, those areas in the uh, headwaters were designated as greenways in the official community plan and the request has for all of those properties to be designated away from greenways uh, to mixed residential commercial which again uh, I think puts greater pressure on the groundwaters in that area and greater risk of those fish bearing streams being contaminated. At least with commercial there's a limited amount of requirement for water sewer systems but with residential it becomes much more complex. And speaking of complexity it's, it's very difficult to be a part of this process for many people in the community, particularly if they're trying to earn a living, raise a family, have other responsibilities to their church or service club or extended family. It's been a very complicated long-term process. The timeline, which I'll show you here, for the bylaws, and these are official community plan and zoning bylaws, has gone on from December of 2005 to now, which is August of 2008, each time there was an official community plan bylaw brought forward that would require a neighborhood meeting, at least one, first, second, and third readings, and a public hearing. That's a lot of commitment over a long period of time. Within each of these as well, there's been the requirement for a number of different meetings and totaling it up there's about 39 official community plan meetings that have been held over that time period 23 of them for the trilogy lands just this is just for the official community plan there'll be additional ones for the zonings as well and this chart just shows the initial designations of the properties as was shown on the map and the different bylaws that have come forward asking for changes in the official community plan but it is very complex and there's a lot of reading a lot of consultant reports a lot of reports from our own staff that make it very difficult for the average citizen to be able to stay on top of it. So I guess that's my concern, is the, um, the participation of people uh, has been made very difficult by the complexity of the plan, by the length of time, and by the um, amount of reading that's been necessary. And my other concern would be just the residential containment boundary, that this is really what Cumberland and the, the voice of the people, which was the original document in 2003, reflected as being important, was the small, friendly downtown core with orderly residential development around it, commercial on the highway and industrial up to the north, and recreational commercial out to the west near Comox Lake. And the recreational commercial, the industrial um, commercial, all had potential for ongoing revenue to the community. Mm -hmm. Residential, uh, it would seem from reports at the time of the official community plan, uh, does not pay its way. It pays about 75% of its ongoing way, even if the development cost charges pay for the immediate services. And so this has taken away uh, also from the potential for um, monies coming into Cumberland. And the economic impact is, is a real concern. But I think that's about where my concerns are. Alrighty, well I'm Grant Schilling and I'm on the steps of my home here in Cumberland. We moved here three summers ago and are loving it. Naturally like a lot of people we're pretty interested and concerned about the changing face of Cumberland, changing gears in Cumberland as I say, transition town as others are pointing out. And fortunately, there was a blueprint to deal with all of this called the Official Community Plan, which I wasn't a part of uh, making because it was already established by the time we had made the decision to come here. But we did indeed read it and found it quite encouraging and to our liking and that here was a community with some vision and here was obviously an awful lot of people. I don't know what the numbers are compared to how many people voted in the last municipal election, but uh, an awful lot of people who spent a lot more time than it does just to walk in and mark an X on a ballot to make a decision about the future of this community and everything from 
uh, water concerns and watershed concerns to um, where are we going, how are we going to move from having over 90% of our taxes be residential to establishing a commercial tax base and where that base can be. And um, so yeah, we were pretty knocked out by that. It only furthered our enamorment to uh, Cumberland reasons for coming here. And of course, since then, we've seen it uh, whittled down and whittled away, much to an awful lot of people's chagrin, disappointment, upset. Pick your adjective. Um, and uh, feel that a, a large voice of the community has been completely ignored, whitewashed. And um, one of the things I wonder about is how a council can have the arrogance to think it knows better than the number of people that put in the effort to make that OCP. And two, I'd like to think that the battle's not lost and that the vision and the documents still remain and it ain't over till uh, the fat mayor sings and uh, you know there's still hope and um, so I'd like to see it respected and um, I guess that's why I chose to talk to you and Dwayne today. started attending municipal council meetings uh, every time they had a meeting we started to attend them and uh, the uh, town didn't have a uh, an official community plan at that time kind of was like topsy, it just grew. And uh, eventually, uh, I guess they, they asked, asked for volunteers for to set up a, an official community plan. And uh, from this great pairs group, uh, the uh, official community plan was was uh, was developed out of that, along with a few of the pe pe other pe people that attended the meetings, and uh, we brought together a what we considered to be a plan for for the for the uh, for for the community. Fortunately, we didn't uh, visualize the development that that it uh, was going to take place, and then it has taken place since. That really wasn't any excuse, as I see it, for the uh, village council to to uh, scrap or amend the community plan to satisfy some some uh, developer they come into town here with a few dollars in his pocket. I think the official community plan is being, being gutted. I don't think it's it's uh, it uh, reflects the the uh, wishes of the original community plan and uh, but that's I guess that's the way things are. The uh, the development that has, has followed, that has developed in here now, is uh, had to be had to had to be con controlled by by council, or should have been controlled by council or should be controlled by a council because it's still taking place. And I think that uh, uh, it has, has to be a, a council with some vision regarding the f future of the, of the Comox Valley 
and as well as Cumberland, because we are we are a part of the, a part of the valley, and I think that uh, that uh, we should keep in mind while the development has taken place that there's many people living in town here, the pioneers that were in town that was, they kept this town together during the depression. Coal mines were shut down. Uh, though there were no jobs, they stayed. They stayed here, and they 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 they, they kept the town together. I I think that uh, any development that's taken place should keep in mind that these people are not able to be part of the development, and the development has taken place, and it's being very instrumental in putting these people out of a home and into nurse, nursing homes that even they don't exist anymore. The provincial government is uh, bound and determined to close down the nursing home in Cumberland here. Uh, there won't even be any, any place for, the, for these people to go when they have to go to a nursing home. Uh, I don't think these problems are being dealt with by council. Uh, certainly uh, has to be dealt with, uh, otherwise we're going to have a, a homeless problem here. Uh, we're going to have all the, these pioneers uh, that, that lived here, uh, they're, going to, they're going to be sleeping under a bridge someplace. I don't, I don't buy that. Hello, my name is uh, Philippe Faria, and uh, I've been living in Cumberland now for two years. My family and I, uh, once uh, my partner and I were having kids, we decided to want to pick a place that we could move to, get to some more simple living, some grassroots living, some community-based living that uh, we thought would be a nice place to raise children. We have two kids of our own, and uh, my wife and I are both vagabonds. We've lived everywhere all over the world uh, for the last... 15 years, ranging from a variety of places in Africa to uh, to the Northwest Territories or to Northern Ontario along the James Bay Coast and uh, even in BC. And uh, Cumberland was our was our choice. And at the time, uh, the amendments on the OCP had not been uh, voted on or approved. And um, we're not against a development completely. Uh, we do believe that for an older community, especially one that um, had an industry that is no longer around, in order for it to uh, prosper, it has to grow. However, um, we chose Cumberland for the sake of the size. It is only 2,000 people in a very congested inner core that uh, is really conducive to us getting around on bicycle or on foot and uh, doing our errands, whether it be going to the post office or going to our local bakery, getting some bread. and. Um, and uh, taking care of our errands with our children. Unfortunately now, with the way things are looking, with the amount of land that is available here in Cumberland, it uh, looks like it's gonna fall into the general problems that they've had in um, other communities like Prince George, Nanaimo, Hamilton, Ontario, where they uh, build uh, power centers just slightly a bit further away from the inner core that uh, no longer is going to promote walking and even though they say it's only 20 minutes away by walk, our fear is that it'll now be uh, a suburbia dependent on vehicles and people driving into the inner core in their vehicles rather than just leaving their home and walking five or 10 minutes to, uh, to do what they need to do. We're hoping that it does stay to the, uh, to the simple living where uh, other concerns we have is that uh, if they're going from 2,600 residents to over 8,000 residents by 2015, I believe it was, um, where is the money going to come from to support all the extra infrastructure, uh, extra, extra medical services, extra police services, extra educational services, um, the three and a half or four and a half million dollars that uh, that uh, trilogy is going to give to Cumberland is uh, I'm not an economist and I'm not a, a budget analyst, but uh, the numbers range just to do our upgrade of our water system varies from five million to forty million, and and that's just the water pipes and the. Uh, where are we going to get the other stuff for schools and uh, 
uh, ambulance services and uh, the extra police that's going to need it and um, and uh, the other thing that worries us is them uh, wanting to put the road right through the BMX park uh, which was uh, from what we were told uh, an individual effort by one Cumberland boy who uh, got that uh, money raised to build that and now there is no real guarantee of when they're going to have another one built by and where um, and uh, that's something that's for the youth of the town and that's why we moved here with our kids so the youth have things to do so as long as those kind of issues can be addressed um, I'm not still 100% confident in the direction that it is going with having all the uh, all the vinyl siding houses uh, on 25 foot lots uh, with one tree standing in the middle in the garage in the front of the home so uh, until all those kind of things can be addressed uh, we have to really see where it's going to be going before we can really approve it completely and uh, that's my say i'm gwyn sprawl and i'm a two-term councillor for the village of cumberland and it was during my first term that uh, the old ocp had reached the end of its five-year span and it was time to make a new one and we hired um, two professional planners, uh, Dale Bishop and Lou Varela, to work on the project. And uh, the whole idea was to canvas the community, uh, all uh, all people in the community from every in every aspect, through the means of various neighborhood parties with a, a neutral facilitator taking notes as to what people wanted. Plus, there were various public meetings, and after a year long. Um, series of, of meetings, uh, all this material was collated into the document known as the new official community plan. Um, I would like to mention though the precursor to that was the idea was that various citizens committees would find out, or get all the background information for our village, the history, the social, economic um, information and environmental and then through a series of newspapers distributed to the citizenry to inform them, then they would be able to make up their minds get, uh, given this stuff. And it was identified that we needed a larger tax base, as you, as you probably are aware. Eighty-something percent of our, inc our taxes come from residential, and um, that is much too high. I mean, technically, we shouldn't even be afloat. Um, so we identified that we needed a larger tax base, commercial and industrial, and uh, and uh, we wanted to other things that were um, brought up in the uh, envisaging envisaging process were keeping the forests and the natural environment um, for ecotourism, for the benefit of the community, for the backdrop to the village. Um, and having commercial, the opportunity of having the new highway run through the northeast boundary was seen as a real opportunity to have some commercial there, the kind of commercial that wouldn't compete with the commercial on the downtown core. Um, the main tenet that is being challenged right now with the OCP is keeping the residence, residential um, containment boundary, keeping all the residences close to the, within walking distance of the historic core, thereby avoiding urban sprawl and uh, reducing car dependency. And this was in 2004, four years ago, and now that turns out to be really in line with current thinking, general current thinking in the world, given that climate change and you know, automobile emissions are becoming, you know, more to the forefront as, as to be avoided. And to avoid urban sprawl, there's been so much of it in, in all the major cities, particularly on the lower mainland. So we were ahead of the time. I would have to say that probably it was one of the most democratic um, OCP processes that have e existed anywhere. I mean, I, it, it, it really, really captured what the participants wanted. And it made it clear that citizenry were to be involved at all stages of planning as developers came in. Um, particip participatory planning, it's called, uh, um, planning. And the other thing, I think the council of the day, three out of five of the current council were, were part of this process. And we were very um, proud of the fact that we, and confident that we had made it really clear to developers coming into our community what 
we really wanted. And we thought, we'll show them the document, it lays out what we want, how we'll go about it, and um, there won't be any problems. There won't be the huge controversies that have happened in our neighbouring communities of the Walmart issue, for example, that was light industrial land that got zoned to be zoned to commercial. There were public hearings that went on literally for days and days and days. I mean, there was such rancour in the community over the whole thing. And so we thought, we won't have any of that. We'll just make it really clear from the start and we'll have this wonderful document. So, of course, it hasn't gone quite that way. Um, what else to say? Um, yeah, that's one thing I want to say. I just wanted to read you a couple of things, though, out of here. I mean, this is a huge document, and I'm not going to read too much of it, but uh, the community vision. It says, um, yeah, the community feels a strong tie to the natural environment. In particular, there is a real affinity with the forests around the village. Citizens respect the right of timber companies to manage woodlands and harvest timber, but they ask that lumber companies respect the view sheds around the village, maintain buffers along streams, and try and bring more timber-related economic activity to the village. The concern for me right now is that um, one of the developers is asking to have land that is designated working forest in our OCP uh, taken out to be residential. There is no protection now at the provincial government level for forests. There was a forest land reserve and that um, is now gone. There's still an agricultural land reserve. But um, it's up to the community to place value on forest land. And I, as I see now, clear cuts are not the enemy. It's paving over forest lands forever that is, is the real danger because the clear cuts around here do grow up beautifully, do green, green up, and we have a really good <coughs> rate of regeneration. Um, what else? Um, the other importance in this was um, is how we how to value our heritage, our history, and our old coal mines and old rail trails. And again, we're being challenged with those. We have them in our parks plan, but there are developers again who would like to to vary that information. And once that history is gone. Right now we've got mine sites, um, six of them, in a perfect circle around the historic core, all within easy walking distance. In fact, the whole route to do all six mine sites would probably take about two hours, three hours of morning stuff. And uh, to lose any of them would be a loss, loss for the community. So we've identified that too. Our OCP at the time was very unique in the Comox Valley, but now that we've got a regional growth strategy, the the various the three municipalities and the regional districts have been involved in about a two year long process to come up with a regional growth strategy that that all could agree on. And uh, the tenets of that are very similar to the ones in the OCP. They really mesh mesh with that. For example, they say, don't pave over your agricultural or your forest lands. Avoid urban sprawl. Avoid car-dependent communities. So this document really meshes very well with the regional growth strategy. Um, I don't know what else to say, really. It's, it's, if you have any questions around it, it's all I can say. But to me, just picking this up today and rereading it, I go, yes, I totally agree with this. Yes, this is very much in line with modern thinking throughout the Western world. And um, really, there's very little reason to, <clears throat> to amend this document because really clearly it is what um, an informed citizenry uh, envisaged in 19, uh, sorry, was it 2004? That's right. That, yeah, there is one final thing I'd like to say is that uh, many people who are moving into the community, there are some new homes already being built that that uh, are within the residential uh, containment boundary near to the historic core. Many newcomers are moving here from all parts of Canada, um, and. The, many of them have looked at the official community plan. They've been trying to decide whether they're going to live in Courtney, Colmox. Uh, Cumberland used to be kind of off limits because the realtors would say, oh, you won't get your value back. But people are interested in Cumberland because of the his history, the, the quaint downtown, the beautiful natural environment, the forest. 
But they looked, many of them have looked at this official community plan and they've taken it as at face value that this is the way the community plans to develop. And some of those people have been disenchanted to realize that maybe this could be changed at, at the whim of, of political whim, really. And um, so some of those people are feeling like they, they, they have been not cheated exactly, but uh, not um, not sold um, the 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 proper goods. So um, so there's old Cumberland and New Cumberland, and I'd say that still the majority of the people, from what I understand, would still wish to adhere to this. Um, to this document. So it'll be interesting to see how this goes into the future. It still has one more year before it would typically be amended. But it's hard to say why it would be changed in the future because it is very much in line with current thinking and works. And uh, the commercial element is definitely, we need commercial and industrial. By the way, we had high um, hopes to have the industrial land on the Bevan Road developed. There was always talk of a value-added village and now, particularly with forest products, but now with the whole forest industry being down, I haven't really heard of anybody with new ideas to come up with the industrial land, but it would be great. There's so little industrial land left in the Comox Valley and it would be great to encourage people to come and use that too. So, Anyway, that's about it. Hello, my name is Leslie Baird. I'm a counsellor for the Village of Cumberland and I'd like to thank Duane for giving me this opportunity to talk about the OCP and the OCP process that we went through and the OCP process that will be coming about again as it is a five-year document. Um, what we find is that the moment that council has signed off on that document and says that it, it is completed that you really should be starting the process over again because um, we were told after the last OCP, the process, that we would never, ad um, developers would not come here because it was too green. Well, that certainly was proven wrong. We have developers coming here. And that, that it, I know from myself that the OCP is a guideline. And that's what it is to be used as, as a guideline. And um, there's some very good articles in the OCP, and I think we tried to cover everything. Uh, there is much more about the environment in this last OCP than had been in any other OCP that we had done. And um, I think that it was the beginning of addressing the environmental needs for Cumberland, because now the Comox and Courtney and the other areas, and also other communities, are starting to get on board to include the environment as a high priority in their OCPs. And it will continue to be that way. There's also things now that we have learned that we need to add again for the next OCP. And it, it's a living document that continues all the time. And it goes with what the people are wanting at that time throughout the process. And. Um, we spent many, many hours on that process as a council. We, um, once it was done and um, presented to the, the um, residents, we went through every single word, every single sentence throughout the document to make sure that we were getting down. We would spend sometimes hours on one word and to discuss, and it should say, should it say shell or should it say may, and the different words and what their meanings are. Do we want to force people to do things, or is this just a guideline? And the other option that we had was the fact that we were going to be a first in um, asking the developers to provide a lot of information through the process. Up until that time, it had been the responsibility of the village to provide all that information. And of course, that is a cost to the people of the village, where it shouldn't be because if a developer is coming into your community, they should be covering all the costs and providing you with that information. So that's, that's the, um, what we try to do. And I'm sure the next process will be just as long 
and um, have just as many inquiries and um, input from the public. And that's the way it should be. Public process. Um, I'm Judith Walker. I'm the planner for the Village of Cumberland. I've been here, I think, two and a half years now, uh, two and a half years ago in May. Um, and I'm trained as a landscape architect. That's what I'm a registered professional landscape architect in BC. That was my background. I actually had an earlier degree in agriculture. And since uh, about six years ago, I began planning at the regional district. So I've been working as a planner and member of the Provisional Planning Institute of BC. So it's really landscape architecture planning. So lots of design, lots of science, lots of backgrounds in forestry and water resources. And that's probably one of my particular interests sort of in, in bringing that to the planning forefront. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. And as far as the OCP. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we are sort of the front, the planners really are the front people for responding to that, to referring to the OCP. I wasn't part of that original group that did that, to produce the OCP, and I think it's an amazing document in that I've never seen anything that has such buy-in by a community. Um, it's almost like one of those cases where I'd say, um, be careful what you wish for, you, you get such support, it became this absolutely beloved document that then any threat of changing it was really seen as quite a threat. And really OCPs are, they usually have a time limit. They're usually written every five years. They're to be written every five years, which is, in planning terms, is nothing. You feel like you've barely done anything and you're already moving on and you have time to review it. So they're very flexible documents. And I think maybe for, for the community, they felt it was like, there we've set our vision, now we're safe. Now we've set the parameters of how development is going to happen, and we'll be fine. You know, we'll be, everything will be reflected in that. And it it's not as it's not as solid as that. I guess like anything, it changes. And under our legislation, anybody has the right to make application to change that. So um, you can't say to anyone they have the right. They may not get it. That's certainly there's no guarantee of anything when they make an application. But they have that right to make application to do that, for all of us, right? So any homeowner has that right to be able to ask to do that. And it's really not just large-scale developers, it's homeowners that have that ability to ask for that. So to have changes in OCPs is not surprising at all. They almost, the day they're instituted, they began to be questioned and changed and do that. The community of five or six years ago is certainly not maybe the community today. Right? There might be new people come in. I would hope that when people come in, they see the OCP and say, oh, this is what the village is about. This is what the village cares about. This is like a, a vision statement. In fact, I've had people come in the office and say that, and say, that's why we're moving to Cumberland, because we read this OCP, this document, and saw this vision. And maybe what doesn't go with it is this caveat that says, this is a flexible document. This is a, a capture in time of the words for what the community has said, the people that participated at that time said, um, and the council at that day supported. But councils change and people change and we need to keep updating it. When I worked at the regional district, the Quadra Island OCP is still, I believe 1980, is still the early 80s. They've attempted reviews of it, never been able to get agreement, never been able to struggle with it, so they end up, this old document still sits in the team. There's some things in there that are really not relevant, they're not moving forward with more environmentally sensitive or, or green options that they should be considering. And so it is valid to keep to keep revisiting it. I think, um, yeah, it's probably, I think the, the community, and that's probably in thinking about the OCP, I'm not sure that the words, that we can all be clear when the words get written, that all of our individual ideas about what that looks like on the ground is, a, is the same. I, I read lines that say, um, uh, I think it said no large box stores or something in there in the OCP and one part of it. And yet the whole uh, island interchange, highway interchange, was designated commercial. And so my question to the community would be, so what kind of commercial did you think was going to go there? It wasn't going to be quaint little stores. It wasn't going to be beautiful downtown Cumberland 
with all the funky and quaintness that attracts so many people, it was going to be different. And who would get attracted there is big box retail. So, and I think, I think actually the community support, lots of the community supported that, said fine, that's fine, we can accept the commercial there, just we don't want that downtown, you know, we'll set it outside. Actually Nanaimo did that, they called it, they corralled the big box retail all north, right? And said, okay, we've sort of trashed this area. Let's keep it all together. Like, we'll keep it all together. This isn't exactly, you know, not, maybe not a nice way to look at it. But if it's the servicing that goes with that, the big parking lots, the arterial roads that are needed, then great, concentrate it. Don't ruin your downtown or change the downtown, but keep, keep that there. So I think that would be maybe one of my, my thoughts about the OCP or criticism, it, criticism is that words are so we don't all have the same vision for what that is. From one sentence I read, you could have a totally different vision of what that actually means on the ground. And so I think that's what's hard to translate, and OCPs tend to not have, you don't, you may have some drawings or something, but you might not actually have that. You probably, it's such a lot of work. Do you really get down to the detail to say, We're, we'd like to designate this commercial, and do you know what those implications are? Do you really get what you're going to get for that? Did you, did you really understand all the tax implications pretty well, I think more so than most OCPs that I've ever seen, but still, you know, I, I'm not sure that it, it translates that you actually get it to do that. So when somebody comes along with a change, I guess it's a matter of looking at it and saying, does this fit in with our broad definition, with the broad part of the OCP? Because there are some really big visionary things in the OCP that you could just stick with, right? Does it fit back with that? And I have to say, it comes down to political will to do that, right? That, that it sounded like I was speaking to some UBC students the other night, planning architecture and landscape architecture students, and um, they said, you're, you're kind of weaseling, like it sounded like I was kind of always saying, well, you know, with the Local Government Act, oh, with the legislation, this was, you know, you're kind of stuck on this, these kind of things. And they said, well, it sounds like you're kind of doing that. And then I said, truthfully, um, planning staff doesn't even get to make those decisions, right? Council gets to make those decisions. We give recommendations, we try to do the absolute best in the research and the information in behind it, and in the end, it's council's decision whether they take that, that information to heart to do that. And I think for Cumberland, it's, it's particularly challenging because of the development issues, because of needing infrastructure that sort of that you can't pay for the infrastructure by yourself. So how can we do that? How can we invite in a level of development that'll help us enough, but won't change us, won't threaten what we actually protect? And I think that takes being huge watchdogs, right? Which, it does take that. And it takes that kind of political will to say, absolutely, we welcome you, we need development, but this is what we're worth. Right, that, that we value ourselves this much. And if you don't like to play by our rules, that's fine. Right? I, I mean, we've seen it time and time again, right? McDonald's have come to and said, well, we want to do our big plastic slides, and Qualcomm has said it, or lots of towns in the States, and said, well, no, actually, you know, you can't do the big golden M, and you, you know, will have shakes on the roof, or whatever, you know, whether, whether it's kind of design issues. But still, they've stood up and said, yeah, we'd love to have you, but we just have a little bit of criteria here that we need you to, to meet. And, um, and that doesn't, I'm not sure that that actually comes out in the OCP, that kind of, it's supposed to be a big broad brush document, right? It's supposed to be a kind of set out the vision, set out the big goals and not get down to the details of what color is the brick on the front of someone's house. And that's probably I take, and it's probably an aside to the OCP, but I think, I guess it ties in because it's part of the public process is that, um, and Pam and I talked to the UBC students about this the other night, was I said the public hearing isn't being heard was my line because I just, I think the public hearing as a venue is just an abysmal use of everyone's time, like just amazingly ineffectual. I think people have, the community has the sense that they actually have the ability to change something by, the, if they say something, um, I don't want fences over six feet high, and then those fences end up in a bylaw somewhere is over six feet high. They said, but you didn't listen to me. But I told you I didn't want them over six feet high. And so I think there's been some leading in to public participation that makes you think you'll be making, the community, individuals in the community will be making those kind of decisions. And I, and I think that's, 
it's like everybody's led down this path to say, so you have the, all this sense of we're doing these public information meetings, we're going to have input, please give us your input, I'm always, you know, filling out things, and feeling as if they'll actually have the ability to, to make some difference in that. I think you do on big scale things, but I don't think on design issues it happens. And one, one thing I was thinking about the other day was that what used to happen, probably 50 years ago, everybody was too busy, right? To, I mean, you, you were busy, whatever you were doing, you were farming or, or mining or logging or whatever, and you elected someone to represent you. And you said, I like this person, they've got good ideals, they'll support what I want in the community, I need to get back to work. And that isn't happening anymore. Right? Everybody has become the politician. It's like all the whole community is the politician. They're incredibly well educated. They're incredibly aware about what's going on, more so than staff sometimes. Like just incredibly interested and focused and 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 that wasn't what people used to do. They used to say, no, that's what the politician was for. Was to do that. That was their job, was to represent me. But nobody trusts that they're getting represented anymore, so they have to go and represent themselves. And now you don't have a table of six people representing the community. You have the community representing the community. So how to get that information from the community to actively take part in decision making, it's not there in the public hearing. It's not there in the Local Government Act. I said, I, we said to the students, we said, if you want to make a change, make a change to public process, to how to get meaningful information to people in an empowered way that they can actually actually do it. And, and where it's useful. I don't think choosing the color of bricks on a building is truthfully useful. I, I wouldn't be want to be the, I don't want to be the design police. Outspoken as I am and that I'd always have an opinion, I still think the personal expression and what somebody's idea of a great building is or, or a great development is, is still basically, that's, that's their call. They can do that. But within the context of my community, I'd want to set some standards around that to say that you won't harm the environment, that you know, you'll make sure there's pedestrian access, that there's accessibility. Have they thought about the oil crisis? Are they working towards that? Are they, are they thinking of all those things? And then say, yeah, you, you know, okay, you want to paint it purple? Go for it. Like, you know, that's, that's your call to do that. But I do know that for some of the community and all communities, they want more control. But I always go back and ask the question is, why are people so terrified that you can't trust that anybody will make a good decision, that you are the only one who can make those decisions because you absolutely don't trust that anybody's going to take your interests. And that's what's changed, I think, over time, is that we don't trust that they'll take our interests. And then it proves out, in some cases, right, that you're not. So then you go, see, I have to be in there, I have to be fighting all the time. And it's incredibly time consuming, right, that, the, that a whole community has to do that. And I don't think you necessarily get the product. I mean, you're never going to please everybody, but I'm not sure that you get the result where everybody says, you know, yeah, I, I, I can live with that, right? It's not exactly, you know, I would have had it a bit different, you know, I wouldn't have liked quite so much commercial, but you know what? It'll still be good for Comfort London. I can, I can live with that. And we don't seem to have that process to do that. And as a staff person, I, I can't even begin to contemplate how to change that because the day-to-day -day stuff is you just... You're dealing with the reports and the application, and you know something's not right, and you know it's not a great way to get the information. And here are the tools that you have, so we'll try to use them in the best way possible. And maybe we can make some small changes that make that possible. But it needs—I think it needs a pretty big shakeup to actually work in a. I think we're using an old style that's been moved through and hasn't really looked at how we process information or who the community is now, right? You know, the level of education compared to 100 years ago is way different, right, to do that. When it was more subsistence, you were busy looking at feeding yourself and your family and trying to keep things together and not worrying about what's happening in the community. And it'd be nice, I hear that all the time from people, that they're burned out, they're tired of having to do that. That, Right? I had someone burst into tears in front of me at a trilogy meeting and just say, I just can't, I can't keep up with all this. I can't cope with this. I have a life I'm trying to keep together and there's all this happening around me and they feel so compelled to take part because they don't trust that somebody else will, will look out for their interests. And that's, that's where I feel like there's a, a failing for doing that. So I don't know if that really focuses in on the OCP in a good way, but um, I think it's a great, I think it's an amazing document. It has such 
huge bind that that's a that's an amazing thing and I think maybe for some people it became like um, like a, a Bible that would be followed and then it gave them some security and to have it sort of pulled out a little bit and start to get to be picked apart when it's actually due I think for a major revision already which I just can't imagine the work that went into that one to start again and who's going to do it like who how are you going to get the community to say oh what a great idea I'd love to come out and spend like my next eight months doing this right that's going to be really hard to do that so there might be I can see doing modifications to it or whatever but it's going to be hard to get the community behind things like that if they don't feel like if they don't feel they were listened to the first time around they thought they were going to be listened to and then they don't feel like they really get that kind of input so. okay yeah we were just talking about OCPs and and that they do give all these guidelines that developers come to town and that's the first thing they do when they come in is you say here's our OCP here's our zoning bylaws and I think it's a great blueprint and I was saying that if a smart developer wouldn't they come in and say what does the community want like I have this piece of land but what is the community what's the community's vision for this and read the OCP and then show me how every step of their development how they've reflected this yet yeah, you know stormwater we've looked after the stormwater we're also thinking about you know reducing our carbon footprint here's how here's how we're thinking we're going to do that and we're willing to covenant we're not just talking about LEEDs certified buildings we're actually going to willing to put a covenant on it to make sure that we do it and actually Courtney's doing that now and they're taking the money if they don't do the covenant on to say they're doing the LEEDs building they take the money uh, that the developer then puts up money and it goes into renovating existing public buildings in the city of Courtney to lead standards. So, OPIC. So, okay, if you're not going to do it, then we're going to take the money and we'll go and start doing our own buildings to do that. But I'm surprised that that isn't, that isn't what developers do. They don't come in and just look at it and then go, this is exact. Some do, and I shouldn't say, you know, certainly over the valley, some would do that. And it seems to me that would be the smart way. You're your path is going to be much smoother. The application process, the public hearing, my theory is by the time you get to a public hearing, nobody should be there. If you've done your homework, you've got a good project, you've got buying, you've been doing public information meetings, who's going to come out and speak? I mean, it'd be nice if they came out and spoke for it, but a lot of the time people don't do that. But if you've really done your homework, it should be like, yawn like we can all go home because we've, we've done we've outlined and shown how and maybe there's small details and you say well you know we had trouble with this one but here's how we're maybe compensating for this or we're going to look at this and and see how better we could do that to me the process would be straightforward but it's not actually how private ownership and development seems to work in bc at all people buy pieces of land and they have ideas in their heads already with what they want to do They've done a pro forma, good for them. you know, they know what they need, they know how many units they need to get out. But I actually, and I'm not a developer, so I don't, I'm out of my league here, but they don't seem to look at what does the community need here. They say, what do I need here? And then they sort of try to make it fit. And then they try to spin it so that it looks like it fits within the community. And then you pull a few words out of the OCP to, and use the same language so that you think you can fool people into saying that we've actually, this is what we're doing. But I'm surprised, and I don't think many developers would go around and, and the entire village of Cumberland and go, you know, there's a really important piece of property. And let's go and talk to people and find out what's going on around that area. Let's find out what's needed. Um, oh, you know, they don't, you know, we could do some higher density housing down there and it, and it looks like it might be supported. Let's purchase that piece of land with that idea. I don't think that's done. And I don't know. And I, and truthfully, with lots of property and it's happening all over Vancouver Island and going to happen more with all the forestry lands coming out and going into housing is that it's where the land is. It's not where the good ideas are or where the existing towns are. It's where the land is. So you purchase the land and then you create this other identity around it or somehow try to make it relate to something else to do that. But it's not its not what I would call that organic growth of how villages used to grow right from the density downtown and then the edge would develop and do that. Um, in a way, Coal Valley is probably doing more of that, like it's at the edge of the residential as opposed to kind of going out and doing a satellite thing. Or Sage Hills, right, is another of these satellite. So it's not like they've thought about what the Comox Valley needs. It's more about, oh, here's an interesting piece of land it's at a good price, you know, and, 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 may, and maybe all the housing things and the golf courses and everything else make great, great development sense. But I think it comes from a more 
self, I was going to say selfish, but self-centered place of saying, this looks like a good project for me, rather than, is this a good project for the, for the village? And that's probably where all the conflicts come, is when you think of it, because they've, you know, there's a, there's a group of people there who have an idea about what's important for them to do, and then there's a community saying, excuse me, you know, we have an idea about what's important for us to do, but the community isn't doing the developing. I bet the most successful place would be is if the community bought the land, and I'd love to see the community sit down together and try to come up with a vision for that and actually do a development. I know, I know the, um, you know, the recent uh, project, Creekside in Courtney, you know, that's not an easy project, even if it's like 20 people, right, doing a development. That is, you know, you think meetings are bad for the OCP, that was probably way worse to do that. But, um, but that would be the kind of control, right, that you'd say, well, the community develops. And maybe that's done in some places. I've always said that the only way to protect something is to own it, right, and then, and then you know, do the development yourself. And that, that's not generally in North America, that's not how we develop land. But um, if there was a way for us to encourage developers, if our website somehow said it, if somehow said, come on in, we welcome you, you know, the first thing we're going to do is sit you down and spend a day with you going over our OCP and taking you for a tour. Actually, one of the architects um, in the valley was talking about doing a center like that, uh, almost like he was talking about it like it's a sustainability center that was kind of like this where developers could come to town and and you would tell here's what we're about here's what we value and he was talking about it in a Comox Valley wide area so here's the watershed issues you know here's all the agriculture issues here's all the things on the table right you still want to play you know you don't want to come to town then you know oh here's you know you, you're interested in Cumberland area here's who you need to go and talk to here's how you need to go and do and we don't tend to do that right we tend to they come in with a a plan, and we say, oh, okay, well, we'll take a look at it, and no wonder they don't fit very well, right? That's a good challenge.